Hi, this is Joanne Clevenger at Upper Line Restaurant, New Orleans, Louisiana, and we are here to tell you about us. It's a street, it's a restaurant, it's a passion, it's an idea, it's a lot of memories for a lot of people who've been our guests and our staff, and some have been our postmen and the vendors. I opened with just one little dining room in January 1983, 40 chairs, no money for the first week's payroll. But you get a honeymoon in the beginning. In my 20s, I lived in the French Quarter, I had two little children, and I didn't have much money, and I wanted a diaper service instead of washing all the diapers. So I got a job as a waitress at a brand new pancake house that had opened in the French market. And it was very upscale, and they had a marvelous man named Rock Brown, who was the trainer and the general manager and the maitre d'. And he went on to open the dungeon later in his career. <laughs> so it was a very interesting contrast. But he taught me how to do crepe suzettes at the table side and about service to the guests. And it was a beginning of immersion in the world of hospitality, because I continued in that field. I worked at the Pancake House, then I worked on Bourbon Street at Buck 49 Steakhouse and had to wear cowgirl pants. And then I left them and went to work at the King's Room, which was where all the bunnies came when they got off work at midnight. In the beginning, I did all the bookkeeping and tended bar in the afternoon. But then I, was, I got to be the nighttime cocktail waitress where I went to work at midnight. I got off at six in the morning and I go back at 10 a.m. and do all the bookkeeping. So it was sort of like an apprenticeship and an internship. And then the people I worked for bought an Italian restaurant on Bourbon Street, Rizzo's, the 400 block. It was an all-night restaurant. We opened at 5, closed at 5. I went to work at midnight, got off at 6 in the morning, got my children to school, went back at 10 a.m. and did all the bookkeeping, the ordering and the payroll, whatever else you have to do, go to the bank. And I did that for several years. And then in that same block, the opportunity to lease a tiny little carriageway came up. And I persuaded the people who ran the Father's Mustache Music Club to let me have the lease. It was very expensive and I didn't think I could make it. But I kept my job at the Rizos and opened a little folk music bar called Andy's, which the Harvard student guide called the Oasis of Bourbon Street. <laughs> Joni Mitchell came in once and sang for us. We opened in 1969 and probably were open for three years. There was a fire at the Mustache that destroyed most of that building and negated my lease. But in the meantime, I had started a little flower cart business and I had opened a second bar because I couldn't make a living off the one on Bourbon Street because the rent was so high. <laughs> so I opened a bar on Decatur Street called The Abbey. The rent was only $300. I had bought the lease from an ex-Filipino yo-yo champion. He used to stand out front yo-yoing, but it didn't do enough business. It was pretty simple and ugly, but Peter Ricca gave me some architectural embellishments, and I built a back bar out of two old mantles, and I put lots of stained glass in it, and I called it the Abbey. What's amazing is it's still there. It's still called the Abbey. People thought I was crazy because it was wine or row. And the way I got other people to come, I took Guinness on tap. No one in Southeast United States had ever had Guinness on tap. I paid them to bring it in and store it. And the New York Times on Sundays. Every Sunday morning, I'd drive to the airport, pick up the New York Times, bring two bundles back to the Decatur Street. Turner Catlitz used to come and get his paper. The mayor used to come, the ballet dancers, the stockbrokers, and the newspaper people. It was an amazing, eclectic group of people. I loved it. It was fascinating. It was like a salon. And the last issue of Figaro, a weekly newspaper, we were on their list of top ten jukeboxes. And I was still doing the flowers in the back patio. <laughs> so I've done things that made people happy. Flowers, restaurants, bars, and then costume design for the theater. Because I decided to split up with my first husband. And I had little flower carts. And I took those and opened them, a little shop down the street where I had a vintage clothing store. My mother took in sewing when I was a little girl. 
so I knew about fabric. And it was very exciting because every day I got to go out looking for things that other people would love. I sometimes felt sort of like a 49er going through all this gravel and you'd find a, 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 a little piece that looked dirty, but it was really genuine gold <laughs> once you ironed it and washed it. And people would come in and say, Joanne, that's so beautiful. Where did you get that? Or, this is fascinating. And so I was taking what other people had treasured, things that they saved, lace or a hat or a special purse. And then when they passed away or made into a smaller dwelling place, they would give it to a thrift store or something. And I would find it and buy it and wash it up and, and, and bring it to other people. And I had the flower carts at the same time too. I would do the flowers in the morning. But the exciting thing about the vintage clothing, it inadvertently got me into being a costume designer for the theater. Where I went for breakfast every morning, Vaucresson Creole Cafe was run by Larry Bornstein. And one of the waiters was named Vernel Bonarice. And he was an actor and he wrote a play and he had no money. And Bornstein told him, go see Joanne, maybe she'll help you with the costumes. And Vernel came to my shop and he told me what he was doing. I said, Vernel, I don't know how to do that. He said, I'll help you. I said, okay. So we put on a play. At one point we had five casts all over the world. We had five casts all over the world. New Orleans, New York, London, Australia, and a national touring company what in the, the place? It was called One Mo Time. It was based on Black Vaudeville, 1926. Uh -huh. And in London, I got to see the Queen shake hands with the New Orleans cast while they're wearing my costumes. Can you imagine? My sweet mama who took in sewing in North Louisiana would have been very proud. Well, I, I was really happy doing the, the vintage clothing store and the costumes. And I decided I was gonna have an additional shop. I was expanding. I was gonna open a shop near the universities because a lot of my clientele came from Tulane, Loyola. And I was uptown looking for a location to rent. And I looked at what's now Crepe Manu, and it was a little gift shop, and the lady had retired. And they wanted $1,000 a month's rent. This was the summer of 1982, and it was not in very nice condition, and it was small. I was perplexed. I didn't know if they were sort of a line, or I didn't have a reality. And as I was driving past Upper Line, what, half of what's now Upper Line, it was a bankrupt barbecue restaurant. And on the front it said, for lease. So when I get back the quarter, I call the real estate company and I say, how much is the rent on Kirshenstein's bankrupt barbecue restaurant? And I say, oh, it's no longer for lease. Today, the owners decided to sell the building. And for years, that location had been a very popular neighborhood restaurant called Martin's, which I used to go to almost every morning for breakfast. And back in the evening for crab meat gratin and oyster soup. And they said, I said, how much? Almost immediately. And she said, it's $112,000. And I got so excited, my first thought was, I could open a restaurant. <laughs> and I could not remember the word option. So I had this long convoluted conversation about, if by which means I was able to give you a certain amount of money, would you promise not to sell it to anybody else? And she said, oh, you mean an option? I said, yes. So I persuaded my husband, who's a manager engineer, to take a second mortgage on our house. Persuaded my son, Jason Clevenger, to quit his job as the head chef at Cafe Sabizas. We spent that autumn, we bought the building August 82. We spent the next four months diligently sanding the walls and painting and all this stuff. And we opened January 1983, no money for the first week's payroll, 40 chairs but you get a little honeymoon in the beginning. <laughs> Jason did a great job. We had instant eclectic people from uptown, up neighborhood restaurant. And then we, John J. Beauty Salon was in this other part of the building and he owned that other part of the building. And he moved to St. Charles Avenue in 1987 and he wouldn't sell it to me right away. I had to lease it for five years, but now we own that. And we expanded and Jason, oversaw all of that. He got us in Gourmet Magazine and we were going high. And then he decided he didn't want to be a chef all his life. 
So I was frightened. I didn't know if I could do it. But he still helps me. He's, he's, he's more reflective than I. And he thinks I sort of jump. And my husband, Alan Greenacre, <laughs> when I couldn't pay the electric bill in the early days, he had a good job and he could pay the electric bill. My daughter, Morgan, helped us. So it was a family affair. And then we expanded into here. And that's when my second chef came, Tom Kalman. It's a whole nother adventure. I have a lot of art now. I didn't have any art in the beginning. When did you start collecting art? Six years after we opened, because that's when I could finally afford to buy a piece of art. The first one I bought, I had to put on layaway, and it was only $350. I had a great moment of great pleasure when I was able to get a copy machine. Because copy machines and printers were much more expensive in those days. And so that was a big hurdle, the copy machine. And we've had nice ones like that. You know. I got to travel a lot with One More Time in London, in Australia. And I learned a lot about other cuisines. And I'd always loved to cook. I mean, my mother cooked, my grandmother cooked, my daddy cooked. My grandfather was a small-time tenant farmer. We were poor, but we always had really, really good food. And one of my most early memories of food is my mother taking me to the tomato plants with a little salt shaker and picking a ripe tomato and then putting a little bit of salt on it and taking that first bite. It's my most beautiful memory of food. It, it comes back to me now, the itchiness of the leaves. It's quite beautiful in my brain. And I think food and the pleasure it gave my grandparents and my parents to feed us and others for holidays, make our own ice cream, I'd help my grandmother churn the butter, and just the joy of making really good food and sharing it gave them so much joy and showed off their skills and their intellect and their experimenting with things. And I guess that's one reason I like being in a restaurateur. You share your knowledge, you share your joy, and you bring joy to other people. Plus, you provide jobs. And that's always a good thing. Plus, you can determine the mission. I can set the goal. The goal is not to be too, too fancy or too, too casual, but to reflect the spirit of our city and our region. And that's, that's been my real thing is, I'm from Louisiana, North Louisiana, and that's where I got that puritanical work ethic. <laughs> and you move to New Orleans when you're 17 to the Big Easy that puritanical work ethic goes really far. So I've been able to do things that other people might not have had the same luck I had. How has Upper Line changed over the years? It's gotten bigger. It's filled with art. We, we stopped doing lunch. For years we did lunch. We did brunch on Sundays. Oh, I had little wind-up toys on the... Do you know those little uh, toy, tin toys that you wind up and they crawl around the table? That was so wonderful because people would exchange the toys. So one table would change their toy out to the next table. And grandparents would be with their grandchildren showing them the little toy. It was just beautiful because I think, I really, really believe that the world becomes more and more full of hassle. Right now, our government's all in topsy-turvy. People are sad and angry, and the hassles of the day, the original meaning of the word restaurant is restorative. And when you, restaurants go well, and they do what they set out to do, whether it's a, a diner or a haute cuisine, they restore people after the hassles of the day. So it's as if you work really hard, and you're able to create something that brings sustenance not just physically, but emotion sustenance to your guest. And then they go back into the world, and they're stronger, and they're braver, and, and self-enhanced. And sometimes I think of teachers and how much they influence the world. I like to think that what I do is a little bit like that, that you influence those that come in contact with you. I estimated that last year, I've touched the table for over a, almost a million people. And that's exciting when they go back in the world. And I get lovely letters reminding me of something I did that I had not remembered. 
and we came and you were so gracious and then I didn't have my wallet and you let me send you a check. I mean, just, and people send me letters about how much they enjoyed it or how much it means to them. And that's, that's, what else is there in life? You know, one of the things that I'm very, very proud of is that I've been influential in, in bringing happiness to, I think, millions of people with the fried green tomatoes and shrimp rumelade because those are two dishes that have been around for a long, long time. New Orleans, the shrimp rumelade, all of the South fried green tomatoes. And when I read that they were going to make a film about fried green tomatoes, I said, oh dear, we have to have them on the menu. But I wanted something different because when I was growing up, it was just a little side dish with a pork chop. I wanted a real dish. And I brainstormed around here for three days, the waiters, the guests, the cooks, the chef. The fourth morning, I woke up and I said, aha, we already got the shrimp rumelade. We're going to put it on top of there. And my son Jason's shrimp rumelade went on top of Chef Tom Kalman's fried green tomatoes. And it was an instant hit for us. But that was 92, 1992. No one copied it till 1995. And then one day I walked into Mr. Ulicich's, and he's across the room diagonally. They used to come in here on Saturday night. And he calls to me. He said, Joanne. I copied your fried green tomatoes. Come try mine. And it started me. I said, I hope you named them for me. He didn't, but he gave me credit in his cookbook, and the New York Times gave me credit. <laughs> and now there are menus all across America. Yeah. Fried green tomatoes with crawfish aioli, with all these things that they've gone, the chefs have made many, many different things out of it. That and the flower carts, the flowers, making flowers legal in, in, in Louisiana to be sold easily. That's brought happiness to millions of people. And the costumes in the theater, where I got to influence the people in the audience, and they would ooh when the right moment came, or look sad when it was sad. And so being able to influence people in that way, I think is the thing I'm most proud of. Thanks. That restaurants have changed. I mean, but when I was in my 20s and 30s, in the 60s and 70s, restaurants were not chef-driven. And the face of most restaurants was women. There were very few restaurants that had male waiters. Brennan's did, Antoine's did, Galatoire's did, but most restaurants she went into all over America were women. So the face of women and their nurturing and wanting to make you happy is not about chefs and it's not really about the food in the long run. The food is important, but it's not the only thing. And I think chef-driven restaurants are great if the chef has the right support to create that magic in the dining room that makes the guests feel special and looked after. Because it's not just a matter of how delicious something is, it's do you feel nurtured, do you feel enhanced? And restaurants are one of the few places in our society still left where people can go and not be fearful that someone will take their purse. If they leave their credit card behind, someone will call them. There's such, so, so much of our interaction with others now is anonymous. People don't recognize your face. In restaurants, we do. Sometimes I even remember where someone sat. And that really tickles them a lot. <laughs> and so it's that interaction in a personal way. And chefs have been driving restaurants because we have become enamored of food for the sake of food. And I think a lot of that has to do with television the CIA and Cornell, and the entertainment value of food. And I'm delighted with that because it's made people more aware of cooking at home. And if people cook at home, the bar rise is higher and higher. And they get more pleasure and joy out of it. Then when they come to a restaurant, they're much more knowledgeable with their palate and their ability to order things they've never had before. Because that's one of the things restaurants can do, is you can try foie gras and you don't have to risk it much. My husband and my children say, Mom, you've, you've got to retire. You can't do this forever. And I would not like to retire. But at some time, you have to retire because your legs or your brain don't keep you going as much as you would like. But the joy of interacting with people, coming to work every day at 1 o'clock, going home 11.30 or midnight, five days a week, keeps my brain off of things that I would probably rant and rave about with the way things are going in Washington. I would probably not be a very happy person. But coming to work and throwing myself into making all this and taking the reservations and doing the payroll and making the, the whole thing come together. 
the hardest part is finding someone to work when someone leaves. We have a waiter that's moving to North Carolina, and finding her replacement has been very difficult. But we keep going. Oh, we have to be resilient. And if it was easy, I have, I have to remind myself quite often, if it was easy, anybody could do it, right? 